Hello, friends. I'm Kerry Farr. Welcome to In Your Corner. Today, Paulette Everett, Everett Norman joins me. And, friends, this is one of the most incredible stories we've ever had on In Your Corner. It's one of the saddest stories we've ever had. And I'm going to let Paulette share that story with you. But a number of years ago, her 12 year old son was kidnapped. Paulette, first of all, thank you so much for joining us on In Your Corner. But that had to be the most horrific time of your life. It was a total nightmare. Tell us, take us back and tell us how it all began and, and, and go from there and bring us kind of forward. Okay. McKay was 12. And M -A -N -C -M -C -C -A -Y, M-A-C-C-A-Y, McKay? M-C-K-A-Y. Uh -huh. Okay. And he was 12 years old. And uh, as with any 12-year-old, they wanted to stay some by themselves. And one evening, um, he wanted to be by himself, and we would call home periodically to check on him. And then Carl called home, McKay's dad called home. That was your husband? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was uh, no answer, and so he raced home. Uh, the door was ajar. McKay was not home. And when Carl entered the house, the phone began to ring, and it was a ransom demand call. And um, Carl called the police. Uh, she was told they would call back as to where to leave the money. We never received a call back. Because there was a ransom demand and because of the Lindbergh law, the FBI was brought in to search for McKay. Uh, McKay was taken on a Tuesday evening and was not, his remains were not found until Sunday morning. Mm. So you never talked to the person after he left the call that he wanted a ransom? This was a woman that called uh, who he had, um, the abductor and murderer had gotten involved to make the ransom demand. And then he had people covering for him as to, uh, uh, in other ways, but she was part of the group that covered for him and bought him time and gave him the space to abduct McKay. Yeah, now in those days, uh, what year was this? 1995. 1995, so we didn't have caller ID in those days. We had, you know, the message machines where we get- The code of phone, yeah. Out, voicemails right. and that type of thing. And uh, we had cell phones, but not the type of cell phones that we have today. So how long did it take the FBI to kind of identify who it was and what was going on? Well, the FBI was very systematic in how they uh, reviewed everything immediately and how they processed everything. And they had us prepare three lists of friends who would open the door for McKay, who would he trust, and on and on. So there were three lists that we prepared. So, so they felt like that Normally, it was somebody in your circle of influence. Normally, it is someone in your circle of influence. Normally, it's not a stranger. Sad yeah. to say, it's someone uh, that McKay loved and he thought loved him, but that was not the case. It was the husband of a first grade teacher that I had taught across from Because you were, you were a school teacher, a school teacher and you were across the hall and this lady's husband that you yes. taught with uh, thought you had a lot of money and decided to abduct your child. Yes. And so take us through the process. After that phone call and your son is missing, I'm sure you went through the most terrifying grief because I know I lost a wife to cancer and when she was first diagnosed, she lived for four years and I literally almost couldn't sleep for 18 months and then finally, you can't just go on forever not resting, but. The anxiety was so incredible, and what you went through had to be a hundred, a thousand times more than what I was experiencing. Take us back and tell us about your emotional state at that time. Uh, I was emotionally wrought. Uh, I was also extremely angry yeah. that someone would have the gall to enter my space, my child's space, and abduct him. Uh, I, began to drag my right leg. My left arm began to palsy, or it looked like palsy. Uh, my uh, speech began to slow like an old phonograph record on the slowest speed. 
uh, my eyesight became very um, different. I'd always say great eyesight, but it, it began to be distorted. And I realized, you know, the longer the time the clock ticked, that I was, you know, you're wise, you're adult. I was 45 years old. I knew the longer this goes, the odds are McKay will not come home. Um, I also uh, w was asked by the FBI to go and visit with, on Saturday, visit with the wife of the gentleman, the man who took McKay. Uh, on a couple of days after the abduction, the police, after they looked at our list, there was one common name on every list. And that was this man? That was this man. Now, how yes. in the world did he end up being so common on, on your list? Uh, I, McKay had been around uh, them. I, we knew them because we would have our beginning of school party and end of school party at their residence. So it was very much a, uh, you know, our school, sm school was small, so we were kind of a big family. You know, you have your work family, and that's kind of how it was. And so it was just a very um, delusional mess that, it, you know, because you think, surely not. Well, they arrested him. I thought it was odd that he would be so bold to enter our property, and yet he fainted when he was arrested. He did what? He fainted. He fainted. Yes. So he, were, he was tough with a child, but he wasn't much when it came to facing reality. He wasn't much tough when it came to facing the FBI. Yeah.